Hey guys, welcome to the new campfire session of the interviews with the Haunting Masters, where we will be sharing those stories that have shaped us into the hunters that we are today. As an extra added bonus, once a month, I will be inviting one of you subscribers on the show to share your stories with us. Please let me know if you like this new addition to the podcast by leaving a comment on Podbean or a review on iTunes. Thank you. Now let's roll into the next episode. Hi, welcome to the interviews with the Haunting Masters, brought to you by the Sneak Tech Sneak Boot. And uh, we're having a little campfire with a master session today. We've got a good friend of mine, Mr. Trevin Stulfus of Outback Outdoors. And uh, we're going to shoot the shit a little bit. How you doing, Trev? I'm good. We both kind of got that Johnny Cash, uh, uh, Merle Haggard morning voice going on <laughs> right now. It's It's early in the morning and we're both busy and this was kind of kind of our only time we could squeeze this in so yeah nothing like i'm excited up, nothing like getting up at 5 a.m to to talk shop <laughs> oh all we're doing is getting ready for hunting season so it's almost here uh, i mean you've you've done a little bit of hunting already this year haven't you yeah i just went to california a little while uh two weeks ago or a week and a half ago awesome and i'm leaving uh in 14 days 15 days something like that for my first elk hunt which is in Utah. Cool. I'm excited. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So you got any good hunts coming up? I do. Um, we, uh, we've got one of our guys sheep hunting right now. Um, oh, wow. uh, drew a tag in Colorado, one of our camera guys. Um, uh, oh, and then we just pretty much kick it off. Um, come September one in Wyoming. Got the, it. Got it with deer and then uh then we come back colorado elk and then we go kentucky elk and then uh, it's just pretty much non-stop till about this till about christmas <laughs> so, how'd you guys get kentucky elk again you drew it or is that your is a landowner deal so last year i went for the first time on a landowner a uh, guy uh that i met manages sixty thousand acres of um well reclaimed mining lands oh, basically wow. and i met him at a cabela's grand opening and he uh he had a son and he said hey if you'll come out and let's uh, you know guide my son and and this and that he said i'll give you a tag i said i'm there oh, yeah. and uh went and spent about 10 12 days uh in kentucky and uh we ended up killing the number nine bull uh, in Kentucky. Sweet. So, yeah, uh, it, it was, ended up being 365. And, um, yeah, uh, it, it was pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know if – I don't know if the kid really realizes what he killed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that's a big bull. And, um, and like I said, he's number nine typical in, in Kentucky. Well, he's got a younger brother. So I got a phone call again. So I'm, I'm, he we're heading back out there, and uh, it's a different type of a hunt. Very different than anything yeah, I'd ever yeah. been used to. I got a good friend of mine that guides over there, Zach Knowles. He, uh, he guides for elk over there. He told me some stories. I went and saw a little bit of the. I actually got a shed. I picked up a shed. It was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's different. Yeah. Hardwood, hardwoods, and you know. Well, for me, it's terrain's it's the, difference. It's the, yeah, it's the, the the country. There's nothing special about the country. I mean, we we live in some big country. What for me, it's the vegetation. Um, mm -hmm. Up here, we have oak brush, which can be very tough to get around. Can really be a pain in the butt. After I hunted Kentucky, I longed for oak brush, because mm -hmm. for me, uh, it was the autumn olives and it was the uh, briars. That you know is just wow. crazy. I had I had that 365 class bull at less than 20 yards four different times with my bow, uh, and I I couldn't get to him and he couldn't get to me and he wanted to come. Wonderful. I mean I I mean I'm I'm you know I got him riled up. He's just going to town on an autumn olive tree and it's going everywhere and there's no way he can get to me and I can't get to him. 
And so that was my main thing is I had to learn how to set up and use the road structure, the existing old mining road structure to my advantage. So yeah. it, it was a, it was a learning curve for me. I learned a lot. So cool. cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so interviews with masters, you know how that works. You've been on. Yeah. So this is, this is a new deal for us. We're doing a little, little campfire session. That's why we have you on today. And, just like kind of what we're doing right now, talking, talking some story, telling some stories, talking shop. Um, so I want to ask you if you have a a hunting story that you could share with us that you know maybe had a teaching moment for you or was a little life changing, something that kind of uh, you know maybe turned the switch on in your head, and said, "Oh, that's why." that's why that happens or that's why that works or whatever. I, I, I do. I've been thinking about this. I don't have a hunting story per se, but it has everything to do with hunting. Okay. So if we're sitting around a campfire and, and somebody looked at me and said, Hey Trev, why do you hunt? This would be my response. I hope that qualifies. <laughs> perfect. That's actually perfect. Okay. okay. Um, so this goes back 2010. No, no, summer of 2011. Um, I was living in Fort Collins. We actually had sold our house. and We were living in a rental property while we were working on another house. And it was a really cool neighborhood, and it had a swimming pool. And it was a community swimming pool, and there was a high dive off that pool you know nowadays it's pretty rare yeah, for there to that. be a high dive right because of insurance you know right well i used to do some diving and i'd like to say i was a pretty decent diver um and i i went up on the high dive and i did a swan dive and i didn't get my hands together so when you dive you always cross your hands OK, right. sometimes you'll even grab them like this, depending upon what you're doing. And then, you you know, extend. And I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't. My shoulder dislocated about four inches and hung at Oof. my at my side. So I came up to the surface and I knew what it was right away. And so I kind of side stroked over and there was a buddy of mine and I said, hey, Chris, help me out of the pool. He pulled me out. It was very evident what was wrong. Oh, yeah. I turned. <laughs> to the lifeguard and she was this high school girl and she fainted. Um, so that was a lot of help. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm like, I looked at Chris. I said, do you think you can pop it back in? And he goes, no, dude, I'm not, I'm not touching that. He said, you go. Well, my wife was there. We jumped in the car. They have these, uh, like 24 hour medical, Emergent. It, it's not quite an emergency room, but it's kind of like a, a, a emergency room light. And there right. was one real close, so we buzzed right over to it. Because what I was hoping is, I knew time was important. I needed to pop my shoulder back in, and I was hoping I could go in there. The doctor would see it and go, "Yes, yeah, sit down here, bite on this, whap." Oh, thank you, thank you. You know, and boom, I'm done. Right, right, right. right. He goes, "I'm not touching that. Go to the emergency room." He said, "That's extremely." Uh, dislocated now time's going on here right so she so hauls butt and we're not, stretching. yeah and we're not far from the emergency room she hauls butt so we go get in the emergency room and of course they rush me right in better so over time they finally have to just put me out literally put me under anesthesia mm. and uh, I come to, and of course, you know, when you go under in surgery, you think it's only been this amount of time. It was an hour and a half. Uh, my heart had stopped. Um, when the the doctor to get my shoulder back in, my wife was in there, in the place, because it wasn't an operating room. We were just in this room, but they right. had to have me completely under for them to, there was two doctors. One was actually leaning on my chest, finally got my shoulder back in. Um, scary deal. Scary deal. Christ. <laughs> I go to a specialist, as you can imagine, uh -huh. and he says, I can't touch it. I, I, I At this time, I cannot feel this half of my hand on into my 
forearm and around my elbow. I can't feel it. Unreal. And, and so, of course, I'm in there. He got me in this sling, right? And uh, I go to the specialist, and he goes, okay. I think he told me – I, no, he told me right away I can't do surgery. I said, so I don't need surgery? He goes, no, 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 you need surgery. He said, I can't do surgery. He said, what you've done is there's a, a bundle of nerves that come through. And you've mm-hmm. damaged that bundle of nerves. That's why you don't – I mean I couldn't, I couldn't close my hand properly. <sighs> um, he said those nerves either need to heal or, then we, or we need to figure something else out. So I can't do surgery. And my, my, my response was I got I – got I had drawn a really you know, decent, a couple decent tags. Mm-hmm. Utah – no, no, no. I had drawn Wyoming deer. Anyway. You know, my first thought was, what about my hunting season, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we go on, um, and uh, a couple more, you know, so he said, let's see what it does. You know, a couple, this is probably June. So now we're in August. No, no, I take that back. Now we're in, we're in late July, and he goes, I can't do surgery. He said, uh, he said, we've got to let this heal. And, um, so I go and I end up getting a handicap permit. Okay. To shoot, a cr- shoot a crossbow. Or I was going to have to throw all my tags away. Because um, uh, Colorado, you can't hunt a crossbow during archery season unless you have a handicap tag. Boom. So I go, I get all the paperwork. So now here I am, this guy that prides himself on bow hunting, and I'm carrying a crossbow around. You know how hard that would be. Mm-hmm. And my, my uh, shoulders like this. I have this brace that keeps my elbow down. I can move my – from by now, I can move my elbow and I can move my – you know, I can do these two fingers. So I can shoot a crossbow. Yeah. And uh, anyway, make a long story short, I found myself hunting with a crossbow that, that season. Hardest thing I ever did in my life. Um, killed a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. And you know, I killed all of them within my bo- within my compound bow range. Every one of them. Um, yeah. But I say that because it was the most import impactful thing on my bow hunting career because of this. I came to a point to where I said, "Why do I do this?" I was so frustrated. Hindsight being twenty twenty, it took eight months. Eight and a half months before they do surgery, I walked around with eight and a half months like this, not knowing if I'd ever shoot a bow again, not knowing if – I mean it was a tough time, and uh, uh, I went through a bunch of questions about myself, why I was in this industry, uh, why I did this, what's it all for, you know, who cares, this is stupid. I quit. I came that close to saying that. I quit. I'm done with this hunt, this hunting, uh, filming stuff. I'm just I'm done. It's 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 too difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hoyt stuck with me. I mean, you talk about a great company. I mean, they did they. I I couldn't even shoot their bow. And no problem. Through a full season where I could not lift, uh, you know, I li- I couldn't lift a bow. Mm-hmm. And they stuck with me, and I came out on the other side with this. I was either going to quit, or I was going to, or I was going to figure out why I hunted. Uh, and when I mean hunted, not not hunted, just hunt in general, but why I film and hunt, because I don't do anything without a camera. I do it for one reason, and that's just tell a story. I film, and I hunt to tell a story. And before that point. I think it was a little bit of a minutia. I, I think it was a. I think it was there was a mix of ego, it being about me, uh, wanting to be somebody special. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know everybody thinks that if you get a TV show or whatever, you're going to be this hunting celebrity, and there is no such thing as a hunting celebrity. If any, if I could tell one person who wants to get in the filming industry one thing it is they're the biggest um 
unicorn is is this idea that you're going to gain some type of fame through having a hunting television show and that is not true and i never you know that was never my full perspective but now when i came out on the other side of this i realized that ego was i i was i had been ego driven mm -hmm. and when i came out on the other side and i started shooting a woman's uh bow and i say that it was literally a gal's bow i borrowed at 32 pounds and came out of the other side of the surgery and i was doing all the rehab and i found out i could shoot a bow again and stuff like that it was the most awesome feeling to, to to let an arrow fly again and i still have form issues because i can't get this shoulder you know when you shoot a bow your shoulder should be down so it's bone 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 and then you're at your anchor point mm -hmm. and my shoulder tends to as soon as i get pressure again it, against it so it doesn't it, it hikes up and I, I can't keep it down and it's because of the reconstruction. Um, and I mean, so I still shoot. Okay. I, uh, anyway, that, and so for me, I don't know, that, that'd be a stretch people, to say that you shoot. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've seen you I, shoot. I, I'm, actually, I, I'm actually <laughs> shooting a lot better now that I switched to a back tension and a, uh, and a, and a hinge. Um, but, uh, actually I, I, yeah, that's that's a total different story. We won't go there. I uh, um, and you can bite me. Um, I uh, I really feel like if somebody were to ask me, well, that's why do you hunt? You know, uh, that's that's the story. You know, that's that was the defining moment of why today I still am ate up with this is because I want to tell a story, and I want to be able to take somebody there and not have them be cold, wet, tired, lonely, whatever it might be. I want yeah. them to be. All the excitement of hunting without all of the blood, sweat, and tears that I went through, um, but yet still get a feel of that. Right. So, right. so that's that's my most momentous hunting story, even though it doesn't really ha – it didn't happen in the field to start. It right. ends in the field, and that's why I do what I do. Awesome. awesome. Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell another story, and you can show us your storytelling skills right now. Um Tell me uh, your most outrageous haunt or your most memorable haunt, the one that was just like, I mean, it's it's the story you lead off with every time because it's got the most whatever juice or the biggest buck or the biggest bull, whatever. It doesn't. It has it has nothing. My most memorable hunt is, is definitely <laughs> one that I I didn't kill anything on. Um, those are always good ones too. Yeah. I mean, to me, uh, I think my first Ibex hunt on the Florida mountains in New Mexico was my most memorable hunt because I learned the most about myself and I learned the most about my crew, you know, and I'm, I, I you and I've talked about this before, you know, that mountain, mountain, well, you have conquered, uh, the bizarre Ibex. I mean, you have a full on beautiful trophy mount of one so you to you I, you know and now i do too but it's different the first time i went i had visions of out hiking out encountering mm -hmm. out shooting out i mean just pure tenacity um killing the critter and you know what for some animals that does work for some animals if they're if you can put yourself in enough positions you're going to be successful by doing that um but i think the uh, leveling field for the ibex as you know is the mountain mm -hmm. um one step forward two steps back uh I had Ibex on the first trip, you know, and of course we're filming it. So I have to f pull filming permits, you know, and all of this, this whole rigmarole up to this January hunt. And, you know, I, I, I remember telling my crew, Hey, all we got to do is beat their eyes, their ears and their nose, <clears throat> right? That's all you got to do. It's really simple to kill any animal, to harvest any trophy that you're going after. All you have to do is beat their eyes, their ears and their nose. Right. So yes, I'm going to add in, I'm going to add in two cameras, two cameramen. Okay. What I was asking for 
and I'm going to spot and stalk them. Okay, I'm not going to ambush them. I'm not going to sit in a saddle and wait for them to come to me. I'm going to go to them. What I was asking for played so, and I didn't realize it at the time, played so heavily on luck. I was going to have to be really dang lucky to get that done. Um, so we packed in. The whole idea was we were going to pack in. So I, it was me and two camera guys. Ooh. Excuse me. That was a that was one of those morning yawns that you just got to get out of your system or it'll haunt you all the morning. So we packed in. <laughs> we packed in, and uh, you know what that mountain is. You can gain twenty five hundred vertical in no time at all. Mm-hmm. And we get up, we get up in there. We we get set up, and you know it's not finding the goats that's as much the problem. It's no, finding the goats fun. in a way where you can get to them. And so what we ended up doing is right away at the beginning we uh sunlight comes up man there's great goats and let's move around here and over here and it's the first three days of the hunt we're in people we're surrounded by people and i'm like wow this is crazy that this is actually there's this many people on this mountain now they were all coming up from the bottom Mm -hmm. um and we were seeing goats and we were busting goats everywhere uh, and it, you know, it, it just, it, all of a sudden I'm like, Oh, this is going to be t- more difficult. And then like the third or fourth day we were working through across this face. Um, I think we had seen two or three groups around the face of that. So I'm actually, I'm like, Hey, let's just work around the face of this cliff. And when I'm talking to cliff, I'm talking probably 90 yards down. Mm-hmm. So what is that? That's, you know, uh, that, it's, 300 let's say 300 feet drop straight drop right right and um we work and i keep hearing something i'm like guys there's something and sure enough i, I get out to the edge and i look down and there's freaking 10 ibex bottom of that cliff right so i get right. back right. get my cameraman over there we're tr- you know we're trying to and i think we have all the time in the world they haven't seen us well i'm just about to come to full draw and they look up and boom, oh, they're gone. 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 Yeah. That's my only opportunity. So 15 days on the mountain. And that was my only opportunity. And I even have it on film. If you've seen The Rock, part one, yep. uh, 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 an Ibex adventure, I look at the camera guys and goes, man, well, we'll get another chance. Or, or it's early in the hunt. And I didn't. And... Yet, I walked my butt off. I glassed constantly. We took one of the camera guys to the hospital yeah. with kidney stones on that mountain. We weren't. We didn't know if it was appendicitis, um, but that was by far the most amazing experience as a. T- if you want a team building experience. Go to the rock. Yep. yep. Takes you a team. T- I don't. I don't care if you're in construction. I don't care if you're in uh, software. You want to do a team building exercise? Go climb around on the on the rock. It's gonna. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna definitely humble you. Um. So, I think. Then drawing it two years later, I had a totally different attitude uh coming in but it was much more of an attitude of humility i knew how hard this was going to be and so for me it's the most memorable hunt because it it really brought us together as a team and then it gave me this fix well i got infected with this fixation (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. a better word on ibex because it's not a oh man i it's not like a moose man i want to go kill a big moose no it's you can't get rid of it it's an infection until you kill if you get the ibex bug until you kill an ibex you're going to be infected yep. Yep. and so that's that's my most memorable hunt it was awesome uh the, the views were amazing you know there's just so many different things that that really made that the ultimate hunt but i think it all boils down to the fact that the animal in that environment 
it would not be as tough. They kill Bazaar Ibex all the time in uh, Turkey, I believe, in some different places, and mm-hmm. the topography is not like that. No. It, it's just not. And these animals are also very skittish, and I think they're more skittish than than any other animal I've hunted. Oh, my God. Well, there's a biz- – well, just to give you an idea, so I, I drew it the year – two years in a row. The second year when I went back, I glassed up like three lions in right. four days. I mean, they're, if they're not getting hunted by lions, they're getting hunted by people. And like, and I was telling, yeah. like I was telling you, remember when I came out on your yeah. second hunt is that, especially if you come above them, they are gone. Cause the lions always come from above, you know, they're right. always stalking them from above that. Like they don't, give you a, a second look if you come from b- below a lot of times they'll do the you know stare at you yeah. for a second yeah or, you know, because they feel like they got the upper hand on you they feel like they got the, the ground on you but right. if you come from above them they're pfft. yeah so, i i think so in our yeah. next county yeah. we sure, watched sure. we watched some that that i inadvertently busted because i didn't know they were there we were in I think they call it Bobcat. It's a, it's a saddle over there on the dragon. Run down, run across the desert, and up into the little Floridas. That's yep. how far they're in. Yeah. And that's across I mean, a main paved road. Right? Actually, Nuts. no. It's across – well, Two. no. It's, it's, Not dep- it, I mean, it depends how they go. Yeah, how they go. Yeah, but, yeah, they go, but yeah, it's still that's, – that's, yeah, that's crazy. And I've seen them come from the, little, from the littles – oh, no, I'm sorry, from the dragon across that big open space – and then up to the, you know, like Capitol Dome and some of those areas. But, oh, yeah. I, you know, I think go, coming back the second time, and, of course, you were with us. You joined us for quite a while, and that helped because your experience gave us some insight and the extra eyes, of course. And um, But I think, you know, as you'll see from the film um, and the way I really am – in. I think the way I'm telling this story about this second journey is it's not a 44 minute. Um, it'll be dropping later this, this right before uh, hunting season. Um, it's not about this film. Isn't as much about the hunt as it is about the journey for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I think it's a shorter, it's 12 to 15. I don't know. We haven't finished it yet. You know, we're, we've got a couple versions done and we're, we're trying to fi- finalize everything and, and we really want it to be our best thing we've ever done. And um, so we've been working on it for, well, over a year I've been working on it. And um, it's one of those projects I won't hand off to my guys, although my guys are, are amazing. It's just so close and near, near and dear to my heart. I won't let anybody edit it. Right, so right. Um, I have this idea and I keep tinkering with it until it gets to that. But it's about that journey. And, um, you know, killing something is – I caught a lot of flack for uh, doing what we did. And um, what I've come come to realize is that you're going to catch flack regardless. It doesn't matter what you do. So I'm I'm so comfortable right now within within my own skin and Mm -hmm. who we are as a production company, who we are as storytellers. That I don't care. It doesn't bother me. But for I can't I can't imagine somebody who's not somebody who's younger who's maybe just wanting you know maybe they have this same passion and they're getting into this and uh, yeah I mean it's tough. You don't need to tell me about getting your ibex uh, film dreams crushed. I, I mean, look, as far as I know, I'm the first guy to do it on film. Right. You know, I shot a number, the number eight Ibex with the bow and I like, I'm not even proud of it. I'm like, I can't even, I got so much shit for my freaking film because I showed that first, um, well one, cause I showed that first, uh, Ibex that I, that I wounded, right. you know, and I'm all about, I show it like it is, man. I, I, I try not to to hide anything. And, and, you know, I get, I, the people that made the point where, Hey, that might put a, you know, a blithe on the hunting community. If, you know, uh, an anti seed, those, those people, I, you know, they came to me and they came to me 
you know, in private, like on, right. on a, a like they private message. Have. Exactly. Right. And I, and I respected it and I, and ultimately that's why I end up taking my film down. Yeah. But, um, and honestly, when I went to re-edit it without it, it just, the story that doesn't tell the story, it, it doesn't tell you what I was feeling, how, how I got to that point, how, why, when I end up getting one yeah. the next day, it, it made it the way it was. And I, it just sucks, man. It, it when you're in the public eye, you know, the public's going to enter your, enter your space, you know, and they're going to yeah. get in. And it, it, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate well, that, and, that and, and, I had and such I, a special experience that, right. and I can't even be proud of it. I can't even have, I don't, but you know, I think, like, oh, I think career, time will change that. Career killer. I, think, I, I think time will change that. I do think time will change that now. Not that it's not going to change what you did. I mean, what you did is fine. And I, I know I, I, I was actually, you were texting me as you were hunting. Yep. So I remember that. And I was so excited for you. And I know why you did what you did. And I support what, what, why you did what you did. And, um, that animal lived and you kept hunting and you then made a great shot and a quick kill on a wonderful Ibex. And uh, I have no qualms with it. Um, I think, what has to happen is some time has to come and then you have to come from a different angle on telling that story. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think you can tell that story without showing that footage. I do think matter of fact, you and I've been collaborating on a few other things on the side. I'm a storyteller. That's my passion. So right. I can take your story and step back and say, well, why don't you tell it from this angle and maybe give a, a fresh perspective just as in somebody else can hear one of my stories and do the same thing. So, right, right. but I think some time's going to have to pass. And then you step back and look at the whole big picture and say, you know what? I've, I've also never seen an industry where people are so passionate as a whole and jealous as a whole. So what I mean by that is I believe that in this industry and I, and I might be wrong, but it's the only industry I'm involved in that is so passion related because I do some other things. But the other things I do, I do for a job and I do at a necessity. Um, it's not my passion. This is my passion. Right. When right. people hunt, when people fish, when people are outdoors, they're passionate about that. And so when they see people, there tend to be envy and jealousy tend to come up. And I, I hate to say it. But there's a ton of that in this industry, and I even catch myself doing it. Mm -hmm. I'll be totally honest and vulnerable, and instead of going, "Ah, oh, dude, that's awesome, congratulations," I'm like, "Oh man, he killed us, such and such, that dirty," you know. And I, I'm happy for him, but mm -hmm. it's that competitive side of you. For so, uh, what I've learned again through my journey that I you know the first story I told was just that, that just that I'm a storyteller and to embrace others stories mm -hmm. and that there's the freedom in that. There's a ton of freedom in that. So I think you're going to have the haters. Um, uh, Cameron Haynes used to always tell me that um, back when I was filming for Eastman's hunting journal back in the early two thousands. Uh, my first job in the industry was, as you know, with, with Eastman's hunting journal as a, research mm -hmm. editor and, and, uh, uh, film some stuff for him. Um, and, uh, he told me haters are going to hate. That's it. That's the truth. So what do you do? You can allow them to take your joy, steal your joy, or you can blow them off. Yeah. And you can, and not care. And it took that catastrophic injury for me to understand and be comfortable enough in my skin that I don't care. I don't answer the haters. If you send me a, a real question, I'll answer it, even if me I don't too. agree with it. But if you are just going to freaking spout on social media or whatever, I won't answer it because you can't – you're not going to change them via social media. I've actually had people – I've actually texted people my cell number and had them call me. 
and 90% of those people, I change their mind. There is the 10% that you're just like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm worth it. Yeah, you're you're an breath. idiot. You're an idiot. Okay. That's what I got to say to you. God bless you. You need an intervention and I'm hanging up on, you now and hang up yeah, on them. Yeah. But, uh, but 90% of them are, you know, if they'll call you, if they have the stones to call you, they mm -hmm. have a legitimate deal. Um, they're yeah. I mean, and, and I've, I've left and never changed their mind and then just said, well, you know what? I appreciate you talking to me. And I said, yeah, me too. I think you're wrong. You think I'm wrong. Well, we'll agree to disagree and we'll go on. Right. Right. And they didn't spam me. They didn't get on, you know, trash me on Facebook. They respected me. But then again, you got to pick and choose those because there's a lot of people that it won't matter. You're, oh, they're yeah. going to sit behind their computer just like they do on Sunday afternoons telling, you know, the, the, they think they're Brett Favre sitting in the, you know, in the, in the easy chair telling, <laughs> telling the new quarterbacks what to do. And you know what? They do the same thing from behind a keyboard. So. Yeah, no, geez, I get that all the time. I mean, the blog, social media, just ridiculous. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I never let it get to me. And then there's always yeah. that one guy that just yeah. like, and I, and then I just lose my shit. Yeah, I know. I know. I'll, I'll either I blow them up on Facebook or whatever, but yeah, I just yeah, no, I get, drives yeah. me nuts. But you know, and going back to the Ibex, so I drew the very next year, and I put in to go to the very next year because now now I felt because the other thing that I was getting was like, oh well, you know, you had you had a guide helping you. I'm like. Yeah, no, I did. I had a guide helping me. I uh, and and it's not like I was lying about it. It's not like I hid that fact. If you watch the video, I, I thanked them a hundred times. I couldn't have done it without them. So on and so forth. It, you know, uh, and truth be told, truth be told, the day that I shot mine, okay, it was my cameraman that glassed them up right. from down below my cameraman that helped us get into it the guy that was with me was had never hunted that area that we were hunting so he didn't really know what i took us down to that spot because i knew how to get there now i learned how to get there from the guy that took me right. there previous but you know and i i couldn't have done it without them because they i they took my learning curve from here you know right right yeah i learned so much that when I went back the next year, I had three shots. I missed three times, but I had three shots, and I was only there for six days. Had I been there for I, everybody, like I had my two my two cameramen with me, and we were you know we were just going back and forth. One guy would come up and film, the other guy would stay down in glass or whatever. But they all, both of them said like we we had one more day. If you didn't have to leave. We would have killed an Ibex because right. I had gotten, I can't tell you, I, I passed up and that was the other thing too. I passed up several billies. I was trying to get one better than the one I already had shot. Or you're an idiot. At, this, at least at the I, same I, caliber. All I got to say is you're an idiot. Well, because you know, <laughs> everybody can say, why you, know, you I know why you did it. Yeah, for it's, sure. It's, it's, you know, when you, when you tell, when you get told, oh, you can't do that on your own. Right. Uh, right. This, this and that. Nobody, you know, they don't know. I don't care. Well, it, it, I, and if you have I, Superman you, flying you around, is about the only way that you can. You right, know. exactly. And when you start, when you joined us, um, you taught us techniques that we did not use. Uh, uh, you know, and Derek Harris, of course, who's who uh, South Peak Guide Outfitting Service now. Um, yep. He was in the very very initial stage of that first hunt. He didn't. He wasn't. He was just a buddy of mine. I mean, I just grew up with his family, and he just said, "I'll come help you." Um, and then as time's gone on, you know, he's started his own outfitting service, but I mean, that was, that, that learning curve was huge. And then for you to come out, it was amazing. What was amazing was you took, okay, let's do this. Let's do this. And you said, no, let's concentrate here. Let's look, use these couple of procedures and let's go up here. And we did, we saw more goats. We had more encounters. I mean, that one time, I mean, I don't know if we want to open this can of worms this might be for another <laughs> freaking uh, uh podcast but for you when we got on those 
those was it three or four good billies all of them were good billies and we mm -hmm. were less than 100 yards and that outfitter came from below right oh you know God. buzzed right by dad and 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 uh and and uh tanner and jordan were down there i believe and and we were up working down on these goats and literally 100 yards they were bedded didn't know we were there not in the country and all of a sudden we're like what the heck's he doing he's driving toward the mountain he jumps out and runs up the mountain and busts those goats out right out from on, under us. on purpose on purpose he, he knew that he knew what he was doing he and, yeah. and then that's the same guy that freaking started blowing us up on on uh, instagram or whatever saying that what i was, was it? yeah i was stealing i was uh you know hunting spots i'm like i mean it's it's one mountain yeah. i mean you go around in circles and circles i i i kiowa knew i was there they knew right. what i was doing it's not like i was like i'm not trying to be an ibex guide you yeah. know i was out there well, helping my friend Ki out <laughs> and kiowa kiowa does not i mean they do a great job kiowa does not uh they matter of fact i talked to a guy that drew this year and i told them i he said who should you go and i said you got a couple people um, I said, uh, one is Kiowa, you got South Peak, and I, you know, I said, I would call. It depends on how you want to hunt. Yep. And they, he, he, he told me he called Kiowa, and they said, well, th we hunt a unique style. Mm -hmm. He said, we're going to put you up in a, in a position where you're going you're gonna to have a shot, okay? Because we know where their goats move. We know how they move. You, it might not be the, the action-packed spot and stock that you're wanting. If you're wanting that, we can try that. But we have, you know, they were very honest with their style, and mm -hmm. they've been very successful with that style. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it, it is what it is. You know, uh, um, you you can't understand hunting that animal until you've hunted that animal. Exactly. So. Um, you know, there's some, there's some great people up on that mountain. There's some great, I've met, I've met some great, I have guys that I met on the first hunt on that mountain that are still great friends of mine to this day. And I talk to them constantly and I met them on top of the rock. How crazy is that? I had to go back to New Mexico, grew up 45 miles from there in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And I meet people and I'm still friends with them today, but that's, awesome. that's what, that's a cool thing about hunting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now I've, 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 I've got a couple of stories like that myself where we met people out there and now like Utah last year, I got, I've met two, two guys from Arizona in Utah, crazy. And, uh, they, they live up in Havasu as if dad and dad and his son, Franny and Sam, and, you know, we became friends. I helped them pack out his deer and, um, I was kind of, I was with him when basically when he shot it. And then, um, you know, they helped me out. They watched me miss a buck. <laughs> Freaking son of a gun. Dodge my arrow. But uh, anyway, that's another story for another campfire. But uh, yeah, no, nah, man, the rock, will, the rock will teach you things about yourself you don't, you didn't think you knew. It'll keep you honest. Yeah. It'll keep so, you honest for sure. Yeah. yeah well, stuff. awesome, man. I, uh, Thank you for coming on and uh, sharing some of your stories with us. We you see got it. it. I know, I know you and I. If we let the let it go, we'll, we'll be on here for another two hours. So oh, easily. But it was good to have you. It's good to see you. Um, wish you luck this season, and uh, you know we all stay stay in contact for sure. Sure, for sure, and uh, and uh, it's going to be a good one. I I'm, I'm always excited to see what we're going to do and how we're going to push the envelope filming and and what adventures we're going to be able to come up with. So sweet, man. Look forward to seeing it. All right, brother. All right. Have a good one. All right. You too.